All right, guys. It is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, and I do mean over the top beautiful, Saturday morning here in the collapse of global industrial civilization down here at Bugs in a Jar Farm. It is Saturday. I think it is June 5th. 2021 somewhere along there and we've got to go we're gonna head up to Aunt Sandy's we're gonna go visit his Aunt Sandy today and uh, but before we get out of here for a road trip on this beautiful summer weekend uh, do what I uh, well do what I usually do on Sunday but uh, which is my Sunday sermon but since we're bringing the Collapse Chronicles interviews back on Sunday. I guess this will start being my Saturday sermon. Uh, so we can look forward to Ben's interview with John Michael Greer coming out tomorrow. So the new Saturday sermon. I want to thank uh, Brother JJ from right up here in the Finger Lakes of New York for sending me this... Uh, this excellent essay he found on the conversation. This is by a fellow named Samuel Alexander. Okay, he is from the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute. There you go, the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute at the University of Melbourne in Australia. I think Ben lives in Melbourne. Ben, you need to go over there and talk to this guy. Maybe you could have a live interview instead of a Skype. And uh, this is actually his Friday essay titled, Searching for Sanity in a World Hell-Bent on Destruction. And guys, this is a long involved uh, essay which would take me uh, half the day to read. Uh, <clears throat> so we're just going to skip over, I don't know, we're going to re read the second half. I will put the link on here and you can go back and catch up. But uh, just for time's sake, let's just move ahead. Now he's going to be referring to some of the things he wrote in the first half. <clears throat> which might be a little bit unclear, but I think you'll get the gist of what he's saying here. All right, from the middle of this essay, take it away. <clears throat> Scientists warn that current trajectories of climate heating are not compatible with civilization <clears throat> as we know it with potentially billions of lives at risk this century, both human and non-human. We do forget about the non-humans being affected by all this. You know something is wrong when the Arctic is burning, and yet nothing is more normal than hopping into a fossil-fueled car or consuming products shipped around the world to satisfy the carboniferous desires of an affluent society. Rob, remind me, we need to go to the liquor store to get some of that tequila sent here from Mexico on a big truck. All right. We are deforesting the planet and destroying topsoil to feed a population that is growing by over 200 thousand people every day. <coughs> the United Nations projects we'll have reached almost 10 billion people by mid-century. This human dominance of the planet under global capitalism is contributing to a holocaust of biodiversity loss, with the World Wildlife Fund recently reporting that populations of vertebrate species have declined by 68% since 1970. I'm going to be interviewing Gerardo Ceballos at some point uh, in the next few days. This is a major thing I'm going to be talking about with Gerardo is uh, 
the population uh, collapses over uh, the last 50 years. We are living through the sixth mass extinction driven by human economic activity that is not just normal but encouraged, rewarded, and widely admired. Empire marches on like a snake eating its own tail, pursuing growth for growth's sake. The ideology of a cancer cell. Uh, we have been hearing that. I There's some uh, controversy who said that. It sounds like Edward Abbey, father of six, I believe, uh, was the first one talking about growth for growth's sake being the ideology of a cancer cell. <clears throat> a spiritual malaise seems to be spreading throughout advanced capitalist societies as if the material rewards of consumerism have failed to fulfill their promise of a happy and meaningful existence. Scholars publish books about it. Robert E. Lane's The Loss of Happiness in Market Democracies, David G. Myers, The American Paradox, Spiritual Hunger in an Age of Plenty, and Clive Hamilton and Richard Dennis's Affluenza, When Too Much is Never Enough. For whom, then, do we destroy the planet? Is a greater abundance of nice things what we are lacking in the overdeveloped world? Or is there, as historian and philosopher Lewis Munford once opined, an inner dimension to our crises that must be resolved before the outer crises can be effectively met? <clears throat> How easy it is to live life regurgitating the pre-written script of advanced industrial society, cogs in a vast machine easily replaced. Perhaps we see our disenchantment reflected in the eyes of those who taught of those tired, alienated commuters a class into which it is so easy to fall simply by virtue of being subjects of the capitalist order, we all know there is more to life than this. Uh, I need to make this print a little bit bigger, guys, for my old man eyes. <clears throat> We find ourselves living in an age where the old dogmas of growth, material affluence, and technology are increasingly exposed as false idols, like a fleet of ships that has been unmoored in a storm, our species is drifting in dangerous seas without a clear sense of direction. Where are the new sources of meaning and guidance that all societies need to fight off the NUI? Pioneering sociologist Emile Durkheim used the term anime to refer to a condition in which a culture's traditional norms have broken down without new norms arising that can give sense to a changing world. Perhaps this is the term that best explains our existential condition today. <clears throat> so, what is a sane reaction to an insane society. One could go on, but it would be perverse to do so. Doom porn is not my business or purpose. It's my business. Uh, doom porn is my business. Welcome to Collapse Chronicles. Doom porn is not my business or purpose, but there is a case for diagnosing our society as insane 
not as rhetorical strategy, but in the pursuit of literal truth. <clears throat> if an individual knowingly destroyed the conditions of his or her or her own existence, we would question their sanity. If a mother only fed her children if she could make a profit, we would doubt the soundness of her mind. If a father took all the household wealth and left the rest of the family in destitution while building bombs in the basement that could destroy the neighborhood, we would call him psychopathic. And yet, these are characteristics of our society as a whole. Fromm would not permit us to diagnose ourselves and our society as sane just because the actions that produce the features outlined above are considered, quote, normal. There is a pathology to our normalcy, my own regrettably included, and this pathology is no less pathological just because it is shared by millions upon millions of people. <clears throat> there are negative mental health effects that might naturally and justifiably arise when otherwise sane people find themselves living in an insane world. The paradox that threatens to emerge has already been variously noted. <clears throat> and Welcome to the Monkey House, I have to reread if you have not read Welcome to the Monkey House, uh, you need to fix that. In Welcome to the Monkey House, Kurt Vonnegut writes, quote, a sane person in an insane society must appear insane. Thomas Stephen Saz contends, quote, insanity is the only sane reaction to an insane society, in which I think he stole that uh, line from, uh, how do you pronounce that guy from India, Kushmarathi, I can't remember how, never can pronounce that dude's name. Uh, and British psychiatrist Artie Lang said insanity was, quote, a perfectly rational adjustment to an insane world, close quote. I think I recall Star Trek's Mr. Spock saying something similar. <clears throat> How can we not get depressed when reading the newspapers today or watching our politicians go about their business with such confident incompetence? How can we not grieve the wildlife and natural habitat being destroyed each moment? What parent can look to the future and not feel a foreboding dread at what world their children and grandchildren will inherit? At the same time, and because of that dread, it is hard to maintain the emotional resources to care for strangers or join a movement when stress, agitation, worry, and busyness clutter our mental lives. This can make society seem like a harsh place lacking in generosity or spirit, generosity of spirit or compassion. Whether it is from watching white supremacists march or listening to climate deniers speak from platforms in parliament and mass media, a nausea sets in, a sickness not so much of the mind but of the soul. This is an existential diagnosis, not a medical or psychiatric run, one. It would be wrong to make peace with this madness. 
the world we live in should not be treated as normal and it should not be a sign of good health to become well adjusted to a society that is casually practicing ecocide, celebrating narcissism, institutionalizing racism, and assessing the value of all things according to the cold logic of profit maximization. Okay, it is okay not to feel okay. <clears throat> we must not assume behavior that makes an individual, quote, functional within a sick society is sufficient evidence of their sanity. In such a society, it is okay not to feel okay, to cry and feel grief, to feel dread and alienation. In our tears, let us find solidarity, for we are not alone. Remember this when you wake up prematurely in the morning with an anxiety without object, or as you stare at the ceiling late at night as you try to fall asleep. You are not losing your mind. It is precisely because you have a grip on reality that reality seems to be so out of whack. On my third reading of the parable of the poisoned well, what he starts out this long essay with, which I did not read, is the parable of the poisoned well. You'll have to uh, go on this link to read what he's talking about. I noticed something I had missed. It was the watchman, the man who warned the king not to drink the poisoned water the rest of the citizenry had already consumed. Wanting to quash the revolutionary sentiment, the king succumbed to public pressure and eventually drank from the well in order to fit in. But what about the watchman? Meaning the, you know, the doomer sounding the alarm. The, the watchman in the parable is basically, you know, people like me. Uh, what about the watchman? Is it possible he never drank the poisoned water and remained sane in an insane society? Did that make him seem mad, you know, to everybody else? Now, this, of course, we get you back into Don Quixote, you know, the uh, Don Quixote being the sanest person you know, in his society, yet everybody he encountered just treated him as an absolute deluded fool. And what was true uh, 500 years ago is more true than ever. <clears throat> Perhaps my thoughts here are those of the watchman, someone who has tried not to drink the Kool-Aid who has attempted to resist the pathology of normalcy. Admittedly, I have questioned my own sanity at times when, for example, I have found myself dancing in the middle of a busy intersection with Extinction Rebellion risking arrest. What had driven me to act in a way that sees me surrounded by police with batons, guns, and pepper spray? They sure looked mad. Call me crazy, but I will finish with the words often attribute to, attributed to Friedrich Nietzsche, quote, those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who could not hear the music. There you go. And uh, this piece 
is an edited extract republished with permission from Griffith Review 72 States of Mind edited by Ashley Hay. And uh, amen, <clears throat> Brother Samuel Alexander. Uh, anyway, Ben, if you're listening, can you please, he's right down the street from you. I would like you to make this a uh, face-to-face interview if you can figure that out. Uh, how to do that, so maybe we will have Samuel Alexander on the show here soon, but tomorrow, again, uh, look forward to Ben's interview with John Michael Greer, and next Sunday, assuming I can pin this busy man down, we are going, I am going to uh, take the reins of our interview with uh, biologist Gerardo Ceballos next weekend. But right now, I'm going to wrap this up. Oh, it's a little dog wants to go visit his Aunt Sandy so he can get some rabbits. There's rabbits at your Aunt Sandy's. You know that there are some rabbits like that. This little dog could, if we could figure out how to be as sane as Sancho Panza. <clears throat> Bye, guys. <laughs>